Godzilla has long captivated audiences across the globe with his destructive power and sheer presence. With the advent of technology, Godzilla has stomped his way into the realm of video games, offering players the chance to control and experience the chaos firsthand. Unfortunately, though, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Some have been received positively by fans, while others have been nearly universally panned. There really isn't one definitive Godzilla game, and a lot of that has to do with the game developers not really understanding how to properly adapt the King of the Monsters to the medium of video games. As a result, Godzilla fans have had to wade through a lot of garbage to get to games that are at least halfway decent. The very first Godzilla video game was 1983's Godzilla on the Commodore 64, and you don't actually control any kaiju. Instead, it's a strategy game where you command the military to defeat Godzilla before he destroys Tokyo. The game itself is played on a 5x5 grid representing Japan in nearby waters, with Godzilla randomly placed in any space except Tokyo's. Players choose between attacking Godzilla or moving troops with options for land, sea, or air attacks, as well as missile or atom bomb strikes. Attacks reveal the number of attackers killed and their effectiveness. Godzilla moves after each attack, causing civilian casualties if he's on land. The atom bomb destroys all life and weapons in its space and the surrounding eight spaces. If Godzilla reaches Tokyo or the city is destroyed, the game ends. While this is an interesting way of making a Godzilla game, and it's honestly something I kind of want to see remade in the style of like Civ 6. I do think that the game is ultimately held back by just how primitive it is. I'll be skipping over some games and really only talking about the ones that I find to be relevant to the Godzilla PS4 game. Otherwise, this video will be way too long and drawn out, but also I kind of want to keep it focused. The next significant Godzilla video game to be released in the US was 1988's Godzilla Monster of Monsters. The game is set in the year 2000XXX. I don't know why they would do that. Just like give us a year. Come on. Planet X emerges as Pluto and Neptune change places in the solar system. Its inhabitants, deploying a legion of space monsters, launch an invasion of Earth. Godzilla, the king of the monsters, allies with Earth's guardian monster, Mothra, and human forces to fend off the invaders. The game features Godzilla and Mothra as playable characters on a virtual game board representing various planets. Players move them like chess pieces across hexagonal spaces, each containing side-scrolling levels such as rocky, jungle, city, and hyperspace zones. In hyperspace zones, battles occur with monsters like Matango, Dagora, and Gotten. Battles resemble those in fighting games and occur when players move adjacent to enemy monsters. The objective is to clear each board of enemy monsters, culminating in a final showdown on Planet X against King Ghidorah. Throughout the game, players encounter monsters from both Godzilla and other Toho movies, including Gazora, Magura, Varen, Hedora, Baragon, Gigan, and Mechagodzilla. Mid-bosses include Matango and Gotten, while common enemies include Dagora and Manda. Godzilla Monster of Monsters is most well known for being the game that was featured in the NES Godzilla Creepypasta, where the protagonist plays a haunted version of the game possessed by a demon named Red. Stay tuned because I might be making a video on that, so keep an eye out for it. Beyond that though, it's not a great game by any means. I like the inclusion of kaijus like Gazora and the Showa era Magura, but it's a very tedious game. 1992's Godzilla 2 War of the Monsters for the NES. Now this is a game that despite acting as a sequel to Monster of Monsters, it's actually nothing like its predecessor. In this game, you play as the military and work to fight off Godzilla and other monsters like Mothra, Hedorah, Rodan, Baragon, and King Ghidorah from wreaking havoc. It's a turn-based strategy game, and much like the Commodore 64 game, I would kill to see a remake of this with modern-day graphics and an expanded roster of kaijus to battle. There is a mobile game that's kind of similar in setup, but there wasn't a ton of strategy, you're just kind of tapping on the monster but I would just love to see a military strategy game where you have to fight off kaijus, very similarly to how Civ VI is formatted, but again, we gotta move forward. <laughs> Released in Japan in 1998, Godzilla Generations serves as a launch title for the Sega Dreamcast. The game features a grand total of five cities, with each city featuring two stages, except for the final city, which consists of three different stages. 
The primary objective is to advance to the next stage by obliterating all structures, including buildings and trees, within a specified time limit. By the time you're done, the city should be entirely leveled with nothing remaining. Every kaiju in the game possesses projectile attacks, the capability to defend against incoming assaults, and the ability to self-heal. The kaiju roster here is somewhat limited, however, it's still remembered by fans for the baffling inclusion of having a kaiju-sized Dr. Serizawa as a playable character. Donning his iconic underwater gear, the gear that he wore when he died, his special fighting move involves activating the Oxygen Destroyer, which is capable of obliterating any structure or military vehicle within its range. Additionally, his eye patch is also a maser cannon during combat. I don't even know anymore, man. I, I don't know. There are so many kaijus in the Godzilla franchise that are missing from this game, and yet they decided to include a character from the 1954 Godzilla film who nobly sacrifices himself to kill Godzilla. I don't know if it's tone deaf or just crazy, but I kind of like it. <laughs> Godzilla Generations received mixed to poor reviews in Japan while getting absolutely destroyed by critics in North America. Many critics pointed out how slow and repetitive the gameplay was, lacking any real strategy, especially considering the fact that the kaiju can heal rapidly. As a result, there's no threat of losing or getting a game over screen. On top of that, the controls were described as being clunky and the camera angles made the game nearly unplayable. In the industry, we like to call this foreshadowing. Despite the negative reception, a sequel would be released the following year in 1999 titled Godzilla Generations Maximum Impact. The game was more of the same but featured an expanded roster of kaiju. It also expanded the gameplay beyond just being a Godzilla walking simulator with combat now being an option. Much like its predecessor though, the game was critically panned, with IGN giving it a 2.5 out of 10. Fast forwarding a bit to the 2000s, and we get a very solid trilogy of games made by Pipeworks Studios. There was 2002's Godzilla Destroy All Monsters Melee, 2004's Godzilla Save the Earth, and 2007's Godzilla Unleashed. The fast-paced gameplay and expansive rosters made it fun for anyone to just pick up and play. Even if you're not a kaiju fan, these games are celebrated by fans as being the best Godzilla video games ever made, with Save the Earth being regarded as the best. Me, on the other hand, I prefer Unleashed, and that's because it's the game that I grew up playing on my Wii. I would spend hours and hours trying to unlock every single monster. You could have four monster battles at a time, so the combinations for different large-scale battles were endless. And in spite of all their problems, the Pipeworks trilogy were just fun to play. Sure, it wasn't a perfect adaptation of the films, but they didn't need to be. No one wants to move at a snail's pace across a city while battling the occasional monster every now and then. In the industry, we like to call this foreshadowing. I want to play as Megalon and then pick up skyscrapers and throw them across the map at Mechagodzilla. Why? Because it's fun. After the Pipeworks trilogy wrapped up, Godzilla really wouldn't appear in any mainstream console games. For the most part, he was just relegated to mobile games and pachinko slot machines. So, Godzilla machine here. Um, I'm playing a bunch of balls through and uh, he's got some cool reaches here. But of course, while I video, we're probably not going to get one. That was until June 2014 when Bandai Namco released a trailer for a Japanese exclusive PlayStation 3 game titled Godzilla. Fans immediately clamored for the game to be translated and released internationally on the PS4. And only a year later, their wish would be granted. The North American release was downright disastrous. I know, it doesn't make any sense. How do you mess up Godzilla? But somehow, they did. The game was panned critically, with complaints ranging from outdated graphics to awkward controls. And at the time, I didn't own a PS4, I had an Xbox 360, so I had no plans of getting the game. Also, Angry Joe didn't like it, so that means I'm not supposed to play it based on like religious purposes. The final verdict for Godzilla is a two! Two out of 10! It is insultingly bad, tedious, irritating, bare minimum effort, in its current form, the best it could have gotten is a fucking three from nostalgia. 
I was 13. Like, leave me alone. Come on, man. Disappointed, I continued playing my copy of Godzilla Unleashed on the Wii, and I waited for a better game to be released. That was until I did get a PS4, and I picked this game up at GameStop for only $10, which is really funny looking back on it, because this thing goes for like a couple hundred bucks now on eBay. It's like one of the few times where like you actually win against GameStop, and you're not paying like a thousand dollars for a five dollar game regardless <laughs> upon firing godzilla ps4 up i actually found myself enjoying it a lot actually so much so that i put 91 hours into the game why are we still here just to suffer that being said though i played it up until around 2017 when i completed the game and never played it again so a decade after the game's release, it's widely regarded as being god-awful and has been delisted and discontinued. And as one of the few people who still has an intact copy of the disc, I wanted to know if this game still holds up or if it deserves its overwhelmingly negative reception by both Godzilla fans and gamers alike. A quick clarification though before we get started. I haven't actually played the PS3 Japanese version of this game. I'm well aware that the PS4 is a big improvement over it, but anytime I reference the Godzilla PS4 game, I am only referring to the North American release on the PlayStation 4. I'm also going to be judging this game solely on its merits. At certain points, I might say, I wish it had this, or I wish it had that, or maybe it should have included this. Please don't take that as an actual criticism of the game for not having stuff that I wanted in it. Those are more or less just side comments or wishful thinking. For the most part, this retrospective will be on what we got rather than what I wish we got. It's judging the game as it was released and not what I wanted it to be. So just don't think that I'm being too mean or too cruel in any way because I'm saying, oh, it should have included this mode or we should have gotten this. It's just wishful thinking and it's comparing what we've already gotten in the past to what we have now. So with all of that out of the way, let's get right into it. This is Godzilla on the PS4. Wait, are you tired of feeling like your online privacy is as secure as a post-it note on a busy street? Picture this, browsing the internet without protection is like traveling with a see-through backpack. Everyone can see where you keep your wallet. But fear not, because today's video is sponsored by Private Internet Access, your virtual bodyguard in the digital world. So, what exactly is a VPN? Well, it's a lot like a cloak of invisibility for your internet connection. With private internet access, your IP address is hidden and your online activity is encrypted through a secure tunnel, shielding you from prying eyes and data thieves. Think about those public Wi-Fi networks at airports or coffee shops. They're a goldmine for hackers lurking in the shadows, ready to snatch your personal data quicker than you can say password one, two, three. But with private internet access, your your data stays safe and sound, even on sketchy networks. Their world-class server infrastructure encrypts your connection, making your information as bulletproof as Godzilla. And here's the kicker. Have you ever missed out on binge-watching your favorite shows because of regional restrictions? With private internet access, you can wave goodbye to geoblocks and say hello to unlimited content from around the globe. From streaming services to online deals, private internet access lets you access it all with just a click of a button. And with support for all major platforms, you can protect every device in your household or workspace. And did I forget to mention their commitment to privacy? With over 30 million downloads, Private Internet Access is the most transparent VPN provider out there. They never log your data and their no logs policy has stood the test of time. Plus, signing up for Private Internet Access is risk free with their 30 day money back guarantee and 24 seven customer support at your fingertips. Speaking from personal experience, this is the best VPN that I've ever used. So why wait? Protect your digital life today with private internet access. You can use my referral code www.piavpn.com slash firewood to get 83% off private internet access with four months free. You heard that right. Four months free. Remember, when it comes to your privacy, 
don't leave it to chance. Choose private internet access. Upon booting the game up for the first time, you are immediately thrown into a tutorial that is an homage to the original 1954 Godzilla film, even with the like grainy film aesthetics and a monochrome color palette. Though, if I have to nitpick here, it does irritate me that the Godzilla shown here is the Heisei one and not the 1954 design. I know other Godzilla flicks have done something similar in the past, namely Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, where they have that Godzilla design appear in 1954 and destroy buildings. However, it just feels off and it really doesn't accurately capture the mood and feeling that they're going for. I know there isn't a Godzilla 1954 model in the game, and I get they'd have to design that just for the tutorial, but like, yeah. That being said though, it's still a really neat way of establishing what Godzilla is, as well as his historical origins to the uninitiated. For the most part, it's a decent tutorial. You learn the basic controls while the G-Force operator explains the plot of the first Godzilla movie. The tutorial ends with Godzilla destroying a television tower, much like he does in the 1954 film. Now, if you enjoy this old school grainy film look, then good news. You can go into the settings at any time and turn them back on. You can give it a black and white look or this color film look as well as just having normal video. On paper, it's a really neat feature that acts as a loving tribute to the look and feel of the Showa era Godzilla films. In practice though, it makes the gameplay feel somehow even more clunky and awkward. The frame rate just plummets and you end up turning it off after only a few seconds because it's honestly unplayable. The reason the frame rate drops is because the filmmakers of the Showa era would often film the kaiju shots at 72 frames per second and then play it back at 24 frames per second. This made the kaijus appear both slower in movement but bigger in scale. I feel like this specific feature is the epitome of what makes Godzilla PS4 fail. On paper this feature should work but it doesn't because the developer sacrificed accuracy to the film over a fun experience for the players. I think if the frame rate didn't plummet, this would be something I would use constantly, but it's just so awful and it puts the player at a disadvantage in combat. Basically, you are willingly handicapping yourself for a neat aesthetic. On top of that, the gameplay is already at a snail's pace, so you're slowing it down even more with this drop because everything just feels slower and it leads to a worse experience for the player. Now let's go over the controls because it's one of the biggest problems that this game has. As I mentioned before, the game pays tribute to the early Showa era and Heisei era films. So the monsters don't run around and throw each other across the map or throw skyscrapers at each other like they do in the Pipeworks trilogy. Instead, the movement of the monsters is much slower and the attacks are much simpler. Using the left joystick makes the monster move forward or backwards. You would think using the left joystick and just simply moving it left or right would make you turn left or right. Instead, the monster just sidesteps. If you actually want to turn left or right, you have to use L1 or R1. And this is one of the most baffling control schemes I think I've ever seen in a PS4 game. It definitely takes a while to adjust mentally when playing this for the first time, but it does gradually become second nature. It just really hurts during combat when battling someone like Jet Jaguar or Hedora when they are able to get behind you and it takes several seconds to reposition yourself to face them. The attacks are super simple. You can gradually unlock more attacks, but I really don't like the idea of having to unlock moves from your moveset. This is something that Mortal Kombat 1 is doing and you have to unlock brutalities and fatalities and it's a trend that I really can't stand. Skins? Sure, I don't mind if you grind to unlock those. Unlockable characters? You know what? Sure, why not? Concept art? I mean, I, I guess. Like, I'm never looking at that crap, but having to unlock moves from a moveset is just insane to me. Imagine if Ryu's Hadouken was something that you had to unlock by grinding for hours and hours. All this does is lead to more repetitive gameplay, and it gets to the point where you don't even want to unlock any extra moves because you're already playing a different game. You've stopped playing and you're now playing like MLB The Show because it's a better game. Please don't kill me. I'm sorry for saying that. It's not a better game. It's awful. But for some reason, I still pre-order the game every year because I'm a baseball junkie and I can't help myself. And now it's like 70 bucks and I'm dropping $70 on a game that I know I'm going to put like a thousand hours into. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm going to play it. 
but it's bad and it gets worse every year and I can't help myself. I need help. I need to go to rehab to stop playing MLB The Show because it's becoming a problem. In Godzilla PS4, whether or not you want to play a specific monster is entirely dependent on the base attacks. If those attacks don't work, you're not going to be putting time into them. You aren't going to be putting much time into that kaiju because it's bad enough having to play as them. Now you're like grinding out hours and hours trying to make them better. Just play a different kaiju. So what are those base attacks? Well, the square button is a basic quick hit. The X button triggers a rapid charging maneuver, and oftentimes this is used to get across the map quickly while also causing damage to nearby buildings. The triangle button is a slow but powerful attack, and the circle button is used for a projectile or range attack for every monster except for Anguirus, and this is something that has to be charged up, so you can't just spam it endlessly. Pushing the D-pad forward and pressing the triangle at the same time lets you grab onto another monster. For me, this is something that is somewhat difficult to pull off, but when it works, it feels so amazing. Lift the and have sex with them too. The clumsy controls are really what brings this game down for me, especially when you compare it to the fluid and seamless controls of Godzilla Save the Earth, a game released one decade prior to Godzilla PS4. I'm just now realizing that game came out 20 years ago and I feel really old. Regardless, it makes total sense why so many critics and gamers alike ripped on Godzilla PS4 upon its release. But that being said, you know, there's more to a game than just its controls. I mean, look at Cruelty Squad, a game with purposefully awful controls that is still celebrated by anyone that can deal with the awful graphics and seizure-inducing visuals. So what does Godzilla PS4 have to offer in terms of gameplay? Well, there are six modes modes in total. God of Destruction, King of Kaiju, Evolution Mode, Diorama Mode, the Kaiju Field Guide, and Online Multiplayer. I'll be going through each mode and explaining what I love and hate about each of them. We're picking up a strong signal. It's heading to the surface. Is this Godzilla? First up is God of Destruction mode, where players can assume control of Godzilla as he rampages through a selection of 10 manually chosen stages picked from a total of 25 levels. This is really similar to Godzilla Generations. Again, Keep note of that because it's going to become important later on. The objective entails annihilating all G energy generators within the map while contending with assaults from G force and occasional boss encounters, which must be killed in order to progress. Some stages actually have time constraints, necessitating the destruction of all generators before the timer elapses, though that is for the more difficult modes that you don't have to pick. As Godzilla demolishes structures, generators, and military assets, his size progressively increases from an initial 50 meters, even reaching 120 if you're really good at the game. Boss adversaries scale in correspondence with Godzilla's size, occasionally presenting augmented challenges in higher difficulty settings. So there's a good chance that you might randomly encounter a 100 meter tall kaiju when you're only 50 meters, and the size just feels awesome like having to fight that giant monster while you're somehow a smaller giant monster feels incredible when you actually beat them to finish destruction mode and confront the game's ultimate antagonist players must reach 100 meters in height by the final stage this was something that i completely forgot about entirely when i was playing through this game for this video i was just baffled when the mode ended after I defeated Super X and Super X 2. Godzilla 2014 then appears and he acts as the final adversary of the entire game. So this is the closest thing that this game has to a story mode. And beyond the normal mode where you play as the Heisai Godzilla, there are two alternatives, Invade and Defend. Invade mode is where you can play as any destructive kaiju in the game and play through God of Destruction like you normally would. Later on in this retrospective, I'll be going through each kaiju in depth. So don't worry if that feels like I'm skipping over that aspect, but 
We'll get there when we get there. Defend mode is where you play as the kaijus that defend humanity, like Kiryu and Mothra. The goal of this mode is to prevent kaijus from destroying the city around you. If they destroy 50% of the city or all of the generators, it's game over. This mode is outright centered on combat. You have to defeat the kaiju before they wipe out the city, and this is the best mode to try and grind out unlockables. While invade mode is more focused on destroying structures, generators, and fighting off kaiju, Defend mode is much simpler. You only have to fight them. So as a result, it streamlines the entire process of getting cells. I'll tell you about that later. Just trust me, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> now, the worst part of God of Destruction mode is the generators. In order to advance through a level, you have to destroy these giant generators. Every few seconds, a shield will pop up, and that's similar to the Showa Mechagodzilla force field. This force field will harm you and knock you down. It gets really annoying when the levels get more difficult because there's a time limit. Given how slow the kaijus move in this game, it can be really difficult trying to move across the map three different times to destroy the generators in under three minutes. It's honestly a pointless and just irritating aspect of the game. It gets so repetitive after only a few levels. Not the generator. G generator. The generators. The generator. It's all generator. The generators. The generator. The generator. The generator. The generator is the generators. The generator. Generator. The generator is generator on generators. All generators. Oh, no. One of the neater aspects of God of Destruction mode is the mission select screen. Look at him, grasping at straws. After beating the first mission, you're given an option of two levels, easy or hard. The easy modes are self-explanatory. You'll fight monsters at your skill and size level. The generators aren't timed, and you can really just take your sweet time just destroying buildings without a worry in the world. However, the payoff is super boring, as you really don't get to fight the more interesting kaiju, and the game just sort of ends once you finish the final mission. Hard mode can be a real challenge, and it shakes up the monotony early on. Like I mentioned before, there's a good chance that you'll have to battle a 100 meter class kaiju when you're only a 50 meter class kaiju, and it feels like this Herculean task of having to beat them as they're basically just giant sponges who soak up all of your attacks. It also just looks really cool trying to fight off this massive kaiju, and it's so rewarding when you manage to defeat them, but then you realize you still have to go and defeat the giant stupid fucking generators. The generator Getting to 100 meters in the hardest difficulty is also a challenge because you tend to be more worried about destroying the generators in time before they go underground and you can't do anything about it. So you basically have to destroy 100% of the map in every single mission, plus some additional tanks and jets in order to ensure that you hit that mark. Otherwise, all that grinding was for nothing and you get the boring ending where you can't fight Godzilla 2014 or destroy it depending on which monster you selected. God of Destruction mode also has this disaster level mechanic. The way I'm fairly certain that it works is the more difficult the level is and the more destructive you are, the disaster level will go up. The higher the disaster level, the more aggressive the military is. Theoretically, this should be a really neat way of making the game more difficult and would require some level of strategy. However, you really don't notice a difference beyond there just being more jets flying over, shooting the occasional missile at you. Yeah, in Godzilla movies, the military hardly, if ever, harms him, but I wish it still played more of a factor here. Maybe the military sets traps for the kaiju like they do in Mothra vs. Godzilla. Or maybe they try to utilize Dimension Tide from Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, which is this orbital satellite that can lock onto Godzilla and fire off a miniature black hole at him. I know that sounds a bit out there, but at the same time, it's like, let's shake things up, let's make it more interesting. One really weird thing that I noticed, it isn't exactly exclusive to God of Destruction mode, but the entire game. It's the levels or the cities that you have to destroy. Some just make sense. There's an industrial plant that reminds me a lot of the one that appeared in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, when the fake Godzilla is revealed to be Mechagodzilla. However, the more generic cities are just confusing. I thought one was supposed to be Tokyo because there's a giant structure in the center of town that looks like Tokyo Tower. However, just a block away is a building that looks a lot like the White House. I'm really confused as to why they couldn't just use real cities, because these just look very dull and lifeless. Weirdly enough, the Pipeworks trilogy actually used real locations without any problem, so I have no idea what the issue is here. I did some research and I looked into it, and I can't really find any specific 
answer. So if you have an answer, let me know down below in the comments because I'm genuinely perplexed by this. That being said, though, there is a really cool nod to the Shinjuku Toho building in Tokyo where a fake Godzilla bust can be seen peering over the city. Something else you might notice in the city environments is the occasional SH Monster Arts advertisement on various skyscrapers. Godzilla fans are probably well aware of the fact that SH Monster Arts is responsible for making hyper-detailed Godzilla figures, but what you may not know is that these figures were actually used by the development team. They scanned each respective figure and put them into the game, which is why the kaiju models look so good. Even today, I think they still hold up. At the time, the game was ripped on for its graphics, but it's not bad. I, I think it still holds up. There are some really neat Easter eggs littered throughout God of Destruction mode. And for example, if you defeat Gigan, his head explodes, which is a reference to Godzilla Final Wars. Another really cool Easter egg is that if you encounter Jet Jaguar three times in one playthrough and you defeat him every time, you'll get a secret cutscene after defeating him for the last time, where it's him and Godzilla shaking hands, which is a reference to Godzilla vs. Megalon. One last Easter egg that I was never really able to recreate myself involves Mechagodzilla 2. While fighting him, you can actually tear his head off if his health is low. This is a really awesome nod to what happens to him in Terror of Mechagodzilla. It's not an outright fatality. If anything, it's kind of cool because he can still fight, just like in that movie. I don't know, it's just little nods like that that I just adore. Now, you may remember earlier in this video, I mentioned a video game titled Godzilla Generations Maximum Impact, which was basically just a Godzilla walking simulator focused more or less on city destruction rather than substantial gameplay and strategy. Godzilla PS4 is, in my eyes, a remake of that game. Combat is obviously in the game, but you'll spend the majority of your time just destroying buildings and fighting off the military. I don't have a problem with this. There's nothing wrong with making a Godzilla walking simulator, but there is something wrong with marketing it as a fighting game. Most of the qualms that people have with this game is expecting something more in line with the Pipeworks trilogy. Instead, they got a remake of Godzilla Generations. Audience expectation played a big part in why this game failed. Sure, the controls are clunky as all hell, but the game was $60 on release day. And I think some of the problems people had with the game would be solved if it was marketed better and also at a discounted price, maybe 40 bucks at best. If God of Destruction mode was just one of many modes, I think this game would have been received much better. But as we'll see, that just really isn't the case. King of Kaiju mode comprises of six stages wherein the player confronts a variety of monsters. The goal is to defeat these monsters as fast as possible. As the player advances, the monsters escalate in potency. Initially, weaker adversaries like Mothra and Batra emerge in the first two waves. This is then followed by moderately challenging monsters in the third and fourth stages. The pinnacle of difficulty is reached in the final two stages, featuring formidable opponents like King Ghidorah, Gigan, and Kiryu. Functioning as an arcade mode of sorts, this is where you can focus solely on combat, rather than destroying buildings and generators. This mode should be fun, but it really isn't, and a lot of that has to do with the lack of real player control. You can't control which kaijus you want to fight. Instead, the CPU determines it based on the difficulty level within the stages. As a result, you'll find yourself fighting the larva versions of Batra and Mothra, as well as Hadora, quite a lot. Just look at all the gameplay I've been showing throughout this whole video. Half the time you're fighting Batra or Mothra in their larva forms, as well as Hadora for some reason. Out of my 91 hours of playing this game, I rarely, if ever, found myself facing off against Destroya or Jet Jaguar. It just gets really repetitive really fast. Most of the time, combat just involves a ton of button mashing, not to mention there isn't a health bar, so you have to like kind of guess whether or not you can afford to do a more ballsy move or if you are near defeat and should play it safe. Every fighting game has a health bar, at least to my knowledge, and even your enemies in this game have a health bar, but for some reason, you, the player, do not. Instead, you get these Call of Duty-esque blood vignettes in the corners of the frames that intensify with the more damage you take. This mechanic works for first-person shooters. It's a genre where you don't need a health bar. That bloody vignette is a good way of telling the player to hunker down and wait to heal because you're near death. Godzilla PS4 doesn't even have a healing mechanic. I think. If you stop taking damage and evade the enemy, the blood vignette goes away. So you as a player think, oh, I just healed myself. And then you get right back into combat. But a 
upon taking damage again, it comes back at the exact same intensity. It's honestly a shame because it's clear that the developers spent more time on capturing the authenticity of the source material and not spending enough time on making the gameplay and especially the combat fun. I already mentioned all the fun easter eggs, but it's really difficult to actually see them as a player because you'll get bored after the first few hours. There's nothing wrong with paying tribute to the source material, but you still have to make the gameplay engaging and enjoyable. In short, it's a fun mode if you want a quick series of quick kaiju battles, but it gets repetitive after a while, and depending on the monster you face, it can get unnecessarily difficult. However, I could see a lot of hardcore Godzilla fans getting a lot of enjoyment out of this mode. It's basically a streamlined version of God of Destruction mode with all the fat cut out, like the generators and having to destroy every structure in a given area. That being said though, there's just not much depth to it. There's hardly any strategy and the limited moveset can quickly lead to boredom. All in all, it's good, but not great. The game includes an online multiplayer mode where two to three players engage in battles using a variety of kaiju selections. I was super disappointed that this mode was online only and you couldn't just pick a monster to control and pick a monster for the CPU to control and have them fight. While I've never actually played this mode myself, I heard that the servers would crash a lot and finding another player was near impossible with the dwindling player base. Nowadays though, this mode is just flat out unplayable because the game was delisted and the servers were shut down permanently. Looking around online at forums, I found a user on Gojipedia named Rathimos who gave his experience with online multiplayer mode. He said, quote, Speaking as a longtime G fan, the only thing more laughable than this shameless cash grab would be the petty idiotic player base and or terabad servers. Your opponent will quit 9 times out of 10 when you have the upper hand, then send you hate mail for it. Not to mention the infrequent disconnects at all of the worst possible times. So beyond primary sources, I really can't say much else about this mode as it seems to be just an online version of King of Kaiju with the occasional rage quit from the other player. It makes me wish local multiplayer was available for people to just play against their friends sitting next to them on the couch, and it would also make the game, you know better nowadays because there's no servers, so you still wouldn't lose an entire mode. Around the time this game was released, I used to religiously watch James and Mike Mondays on the Cinemassacre YouTube channel, and I think seeing their reaction to the game not having local multiplayer just goes to show what a missed opportunity this whole thing was. And maybe you don't do that. Maybe it's just like online multiplayer. That, 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 I, I can't believe that. What do you, what, you, you, mean, you mean two people sitting on a couch are obsolete? I don't like, think people. I don't think people do that anymore. You, people don't play in the same room as other people anymore. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's it's the online gaming is is cool. I mean, it, it's awesome, but it's like why? Uh, wait, to, that you, can't that can't be. You're what supposed it is. to be at your house with like a headset on. So I didn't even need to drive over. I should have I should have got my own copy of the game, played it at my house with him. Evolution mode isn't a mode. It, it's basically a skill tree where you can unlock and upgrade the playable kaiju in the game as well as abilities and emotes. In order to actually unlock these things you need to spend a lot of time grinding in God of Destruction mode in order to get the proper cells needed. Every kaiju releases evolution factors upon defeat, referred to as cells for the organic kaiju and parts or circuit boards for mechas and cybernetic kaiju that serve to enhance the abilities of each respective kaiju. These evolution factors can also be acquired by completing specific modes using particular kaiju. Upgrading each kaiju demands evolution energy, which is earned by playing as that specific monster. Where it gets confusing is that certain upgrades require other kaiju cells or parts. So, for example, upgrading Godzilla's gauge for his atomic breath requires Godzilla cells. Makes sense but it also requires Jet Jaguar and Gigan cells. It honestly feels a bit backwards. In most fighting games, like, say, Injustice 2, if you play as Blue Beetle and use him a ton, you get rewards for that character and that character alone. Godzilla PS4 does not work this way. It doesn't matter if you spend hours and hours playing as Kiryu, you will have an endless supply of Batra larva or Hedora cells because you will do nothing but fight them. Sure, you do get cells from the monsters you play as once you complete the mode, but it's nowhere near as much as it really should be. This is more of a general comment than something related to evolution mode, but I love the usage of actual stills or promotional images of the 
kaijus from their respective films. The developers could have easily used the models from the game in a unique background or pose, but instead they used images, and it really adds to the game's aesthetic and attitude of being a loving tribute to the Godzilla films from yesteryear. Diorama mode is one of the most disappointing and pointless modes I think I've ever seen included in a video game. At first, I thought this was a single-player fight mode where you can pick the monster you want to control and then pick which monster you want to fight, as it's standard for most fighting games. However, I was appalled to discover that diorama mode is just photo mode. You can put models of kaijus in various environments from the game, but you can't even do this when you first fire up the game, you have to unlock various poses of different kaijus with evolution mode, and then you could take screenshots. And, like, if I get kaiju cells, I'm not wasting it on this. I'm going to put it towards my gauge or, you know, upgrading my projectile because, like, that, that actually serves a purpose. This mode honestly feels like something from the PS2 era of gaming. On its own, it's harmless, and it's a bit of a throwback, but... It doesn't need to be included in the game, but for some reason, it is. I could easily see someone spending a few hours messing around with it and coming up with a bunch of different scenarios and whatnot, but when looking at all the other modes, or rather, lack thereof, it really feels like the developers were just grasping at straws and trying to fluff the game up to make it appear as if there were more features than there really are. The Kaiju Field Guide is just a dumbed-down version of Wikizilla. Players are able to unlock biographies detailing various monsters from the Godzilla series, even extending beyond those featured directly in the game, which can be really disappointing considering the somewhat lackluster roster. These biographies contain images of the monsters from their respective films, accompanied by detailed information about their attributes and appearances in various films. For hardcore fans, this mode isn't much fun because... They likely already know this information, but for the uninitiated, I can see the Kaiju Field Guide being a useful tool for identifying the Kaijus in the game, as well as the ones that aren't in the game but appear in the films. I'm not opposed to this being in the game, but I would prefer if there were more things to do in the game. I'm almost convinced this was added to the game because the main menu would have looked really barren and lackluster with only God of Destruction, King of Kaiju, and Online Multiplayer. After all, those are the only modes with actual gameplay in them. In my mind, the Heisei Godzilla is the definitive Godzilla design. I think a lot of people would disagree, and they might think the legendary Godzilla is, but at least for me, the Heisei one is like the default design. A lot of that has to do with the fact that beyond a few Showa flicks, I watch the Heisei films more than any other entries in the Godzilla franchise. Even beyond that, though, it's just a solid design with a distinct silhouette. Godzilla PS4 nails the look and feel of the Heisei era iteration of the character. Previous video game adaptations of this specific Godzilla have always been a bit off to me. Notably, Godzilla Unleashed, which features a version of the character that felt more like a palette swap of Godzilla 54. In this game, you truly feel like a walking tank, especially when it's just you versus the military. In the Pipeworks trilogy, I always got the feeling that Godzilla was the least interesting kaiju in the game's roster. There was almost always more emphasis on other monsters. Godzilla PS4, though, is quite the opposite. Godzilla is the most interesting monster on this roster. Just look at how diverse his moveset is compared to the other playable kaijus in the game. Granted, I think a lot of this has to do with the PS3 version of the game that was only available in Japan being out a year prior, and in that game, Godzilla was the only playable character. So it makes sense as to why the other monsters aren't nearly as fleshed out as he is. When playing God of Destruction mode, Godzilla's special, the nuclear pulse attack, can be devastating for decimating the structures around you. One key strategy that I have been using is just going to the center of a bunch of structures and unleashing the nuclear pulse. Godzilla's atomic breath is also great for combat, though sometimes I encounter a problem where it isn't focused and I accidentally just attack a tiny helicopter in front of me rather than the giant kaiju that's about to attack. You can play as Burning Godzilla, though it does feel like a palette swap at times. Sure, the atomic breath is accurate to how it appears in Godzilla vs. Destroya, but it's virtually the exact same monster despite it being listed as a separate kaiju. The same goes for Godzilla 1964 and Godzilla 2014, which were included as pre-order bonuses. 
However, since the game was delisted and discontinued, these monsters are available for free now if you're lucky enough to own a copy of the game. Godzilla 1964 is basically just a reskin of the Heisei Godzilla with a much weaker atomic breath. Seriously, I feel like I'm just blowing mist on the enemy and it barely does any damage. Beyond that though, there isn't really much else to write home about beyond the model looking absolutely phenomenal. It would be great if the developers made this less of a skin and more of a separate character, like how Godzilla 1954 and Godzilla 2000 have entirely different movesets in Godzilla Unleashed. On aesthetics alone, this would be my favorite monster in the entire game, but that atomic breath is just god-awful, and it makes Godzilla 1964 almost entirely unplayable. The Godzilla 2014 skin is kind of cool. Much like his film counterpart, Godzilla 2014 is a brawler. His entire moveset is solely built upon close combat, and it's wildly different from the Showa, Heisei, and Burning Godzilla skins. This feels like one of the fastest movesets in the entire game, even if it really isn't. On top of that, the atomic breath feels absolutely incredible to use. It does feel a bit odd that Godzilla 2014 is considered an invader in the God of Destruction mode and not a defender, given that he hardly destroys any buildings in the 2014 film and is solely focused on protecting humanity from the invading Mudos. Seeing this Godzilla destroy skyscrapers intentionally, might I add, just feels so wrong. I know it's a nitpick, but it just does not feel in line with the character. Beyond that, though, Godzilla serves his purpose as being the default playable kaiju for this game. The moveset is diverse as long as you grind towards expanding the standard moveset. That being said, though, Godzilla isn't the only playable character in this game, so I'll be going through each monster in depth and explaining what I like and what I don't like about them in this specific game. We finally have a very solid, angurous, video game playable character. He's always kind of gotten the short end of the stick, in my opinion. He was decent in Godzilla Unleashed, and, you know, he had that one move where he could roll into a ball and then he'd go around the map. Like, that was cool. But beyond that, it's like, nah, no one's actually going to play as him. Like, come on. In this game, he's a brawler. Oftentimes, he deals a lot of damage when getting up close and personal. His entire moveset takes a lot of cues from his film appearances, and one of my favorite attacks is the one where he burrows underground. When fighting against Angurus, this can be very annoying, but when playing as him, it's really fun to just cheese this attack. Similar to his appearance in Godzilla Unleashed, he doesn't have a ranged attack, like almost every other monster in that game. And as a result, you're at a bit of a disadvantage when playing as him. It very much depends on your playstyle, but if you heavily rely on using ranged attacks, it's probably best if you avoid playing as Angurus. As for me, I get my ass handed to me when playing as him because my playstyle just relies so heavily on ranged attacks. But if you're a brawler, go for it. The developers nailed Angurus' look down to a T. I'll be saying this about pretty much every monster in the game, but the model looks phenomenal. There's this really neat Easter egg in his Kaiju Field Guide entry that references the American redub of Godzilla Raids again, which had every character called Godzilla Gigantus. There's clearly a lot of love for Anguirus by the dev team, and it shows. Still, he's not my favorite Kaiju to play as in this game, but that's more on me than anything else. Guys, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Rodan is kind of mid in this game. I think the sentiment I have comes from the fact that I used to main him back in Godzilla Unleashed. He isn't terrible here, but is nowhere near as good as how he was in the Pipeworks trilogy. This is one of the few monsters in the game that I actually hate the character model of, too. I understand it's supposed to be the 1956 design, but I just think it's one of the worst designs of Rodan. It's inferior to Final Wars Rodan in Fire Rodan from Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. There's just something about this 1956 design that just looks so derpy. Regardless, Rodan in the PS4 game is actually super useful in God of Destruction mode. You can easily destroy a generator in only a few moves without having to deal with the force fields coming up. Beyond that though, like, it's fine. There's not much else to say about it. I, like it's It's mid, I don't know.
There are two playable forms of Mothra in Godzilla PS4. The first is a larva form, and the other is her Imago form. If I'm being honest, I'm not a huge fan of either. Apologies to the Mothra stands, but I just can't get behind this move set. Mothra's larva form is objectively one of the weakest in the entire game. Navigating can be a chore, which is saying a lot considering what game we're actually talking about right now. It's just not a fun experience. Mothra's Imago form is just a hassle to play as. At the end of the day, it comes down to personal preference, but neither kaijus are really my thing. That being said though, the character models do look fantastic. I know it sounds like it isn't hard to mess up Mothra in a video game, but... <laughs> Ghidorah is one of the best kaijus in the entire game when trying to grind through God of Destruction mode. He has this one move where you can fly up, spin, and then dive forward, and it decimates everything around you and in front of you. It's essentially a foolproof way of quickly destroying everything in your path. Combat is also a breeze for the most part. There are a lot of combo breakers littered throughout Ghidorah's moveset which you can definitely use in order to get a cheap win. My only real gripe with Ghidorah in the PS4 game are the gravity beams. Sure, they cause a ton of damage, however, they are very unfocused. You can't aim this projectile, and if you want to target something specific, then it's a game of chance as to whether or not it's actually going to do any substantial harm. Ghidorah's special attack is also very underwhelming, as it's just a basic windstorm. It's great for getting some distance between you and the enemy kaiju, but it hardly does anything against structures or the military. Beyond these negatives though, I had a lot of fun playing as Ghidorah. You can quickly get across the map by flying, which is great for the more difficult levels in God of Destruction mode that have a time limit. The model here looks fantastic. The Hayside design was always my favorite Ghidorah look, and I'm really happy to see it being used here. I also love the flying animation. It's basically one-to-one -one with his on-screen appearances. But that being said though, all of this is kind of ruined by the camera as it's way too close to Ghidorah. As a result, you can't appreciate all the hard work that the devs put in to make this iteration of the kaiju so accurate. This also makes combat more difficult as you really can't see over Ghidorah, so you spend half the match moving the camera with the right stick in order to get a halfway decent angle. Regardless, King Ghidorah is one of the best kaijus in the entire game. I highly recommend playing as him. You know that one meme that's like when you play the final boss versus when you unlock them? That is the epitome of Hedora. Whenever you encounter the smog monster in King of Kaiju or God of Destruction, she's the worst. Hedora has this one belly flop attack that she just spams endlessly, and you have to just hope for the best and pray that you can break that combo with a special or just roar in order to block it. Once you actually play as Hedora, that belly flop attack is constantly being broken up by the other monster. I genuinely don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm going to be saying this a lot in this retrospective, so strap in, but this design looks incredible. It looks one-to-one -one with how the character appeared in Godzilla vs. Hedora. On top of that, the animations are a perfect adaptation of the kaiju. The attacks are ripped straight from the film, with certain things like Hedora's Hedrium Ray being shot out from above the pupil rather than directly out, being such a nice touch. I also think it's important to note that this is Hedora's first appearance in a video game as a playable character instead of just another enemy, like in Godzilla Destroy All Monsters Melee or Godzilla Monster of Monsters. Hedora is one of my all-time favorite kaijus, with Godzilla vs. Hedora being one of my all-time favorite Godzilla films in the entire franchise, so it's a treat seeing her being included in a video game as a playable character for once. You just better pray that you never have to face her in combat, otherwise it's going to be one hell of a fight. The Showa Mechagodzilla can be both fun and challenging. It's a ranged fighter, so a lot of your attacks are based around all the weapons from the films. His space beams deal a lot of damage, but my personal favorite attack is the rotating finger missiles. These have a great knockback effect, which is great if you need a few seconds to recombobulate yourself. They do take a while to load up, but the generic finger missile attack is quicker, but it deals less damage. 
It also lacks a knockback effect for some reason. Regardless, the close quarters combat is somewhat basic. You're not going to do a ton of damage unless you activate your special attack first, which is the defense Neil barrier. There really isn't much of a difference when comparing Mechagodzilla and Mechagodzilla 2, as they both function the exact same and are essentially a palette swap, with 2 being a bit dirtier and less shinier. Of course, Mechagodzilla 2 features that unique decapitation easter egg that I mentioned prior, but they're basically the same character, all things considered. Back when I used to play this game religiously in 2017, I put hours and hours into playing as Biolante. I would even go as far as to say that she was my main besides maybe Gigan. The fact that you can easily separate yourself from the enemy while still dealing damage basically made you unstoppable. The tentacle dance attack is one of my favorites in the game, but even the basic tendrils attack can do an unholy amount of damage on the enemy. On top of that, I upgraded Biolante to basically have an endless supply of acidic sap ready to fire at will. Seriously, I was an absolute menace playing as the Bio Monster. 10 out of 10, one of the best monsters in the entire game. Absolutely goaded. <laughs> Batra's larva form is a challenge to play as in combat, but if you learn your way around it, it can be a really fun experience. You're at a bit of a disadvantage for sure, given the limited attacks, but the moveset is perfectly competent. One of my favorite attacks is when you roar and then fire off his prism beams. The model also looks really awesome with the crawling animation being a highlight. It takes the Heisei appearance of Batra and somehow manages to make it even cooler than its film appearance. Sure, it gets really annoying having to face off against the larva version of Batra throughout the games, but I surprisingly don't mind playing as him from time to time if I want a real challenge. Batra's Imago form has some fairly neat moves, but for the most part, I just can't get behind it. The animations in the character model look phenomenal. Like the larva form, the Imago form has a prism beam that deals a lot of damage, but also just looks really cool and is satisfying to fire off. Beyond that though, I'm just not a fan of this kaiju. The same goes for Mothra. At the end of the day, it's down to personal preference, but I just can't get behind Batra and find the gameplay and movesets to be somewhat boring in its imago form. Space Godzilla might be one of the worst monsters in the entire game, and that's saying a lot. It honestly disappoints me. He was so cool in Godzilla Unleashed, and this was just such a letdown in comparison. Much like in his sole film appearance, Space Godzilla is heavily reliant on his crystals. The only time he's capable of powering up his Corona Beam is when he has his crystals intact. Without them, he can't fire any projectiles and moves incredibly slow with his power coming from the crystals. This is such a massive handicap because you spend half the battle trying to generate his big dumb crystals out of the ground so that you can land a few attacks. Even if you do get them out of the ground, the Kaiju you're fighting will just destroy them with very little effort. So. It just takes you right back to square one. Sure, this is accurate to how he is in the films, as he is heavily reliant on his crystals, but he is also shown to be perfectly capable of taking on Godzilla or Magra solo without them. In close quarters combat, Space Godzilla is really not going to do much. A lot of this has to do with the character being more of a projectile-driven fighter, so it's basically a lose-lose. Either try and use your Corona Beam and get your ass handed to you, or try to fight like a brawler and get your ass handed to you. Like That's that's the only other outcome. He also moves so slow, which is saying a lot considering that we're talking about Godzilla PS4. So, in short, stay away. You will not have a good time playing a Space Godzilla. <laughs> Back in 2017, when I would play this game religiously, 
I took forever to unlock Destroya. I probably went months without ever encountering him in God of Destruction mode or even King of Kaiju mode. He was the very last Kaiju that I ended up unlocking and it was only because I needed to Google how to do it. As a result, I built up this idea in my head of Destroya being this S tier character in the game when in actuality he's maybe a B tier or even A? I don't know. You see, Destroya is one of the most devastating kaijus that you can play as in God of Destruction mode. His Oxygen Destroyer Ray can annihilate several city blocks with only one sweeping move. I also really like the Close Quarters combat move set here, though I am a bit biased considering that Destroya was the best character in Godzilla Unleashed because you could just spam his unblockable variable slicer and win without taking any damage. But at the same time, though, this is a fun kaiju to play as, even if it is super clunky at times, but that goes for any kaiju in this game. I also have a similar problem that I had with King Kidora regarding the camera. It needs to be moved back so I can actually see what I'm doing. Basically, it's good, not great. Beyond Biollante, Gigan was my main. I dropped hours into playing as the cyborg monster. The chainsaw tackle move is absolutely unstoppable. Pair that with the somersault kick and you're unbeatable. I love his laser cluster attack. There's just something about it that looks so aesthetically pleasing. It's also nice to see it appear in a video game, considering that Godzilla Unleashed utilized the exact same Final Wars design, but had the laser beam be straight and not a cluster shot. The decision to use the modified Gigan design instead of his Showa era design, or even the basic Final Wars design, really makes this appearance stand out from the rest. This was always one of my favorite designs of the character, and seeing it here in all of its glory just makes it even more satisfying. The chainsaws are just awesome, and they need to be utilized more in the character's future appearances. I also really want a figure of this, but they're all so hard to find. 10 out of 10 kaiju, the best in the entire game. The highlight of this move set is the Mega Buster projectile attack. It just feels fantastic to use. And one really neat detail that I noticed is how Super Mech Godzilla still takes damage from beam attacks, but he hardly moves when getting hit. This is a reference to his soul film appearance, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, where the exact same thing happens. Super Mechagodzilla was always my least favorite Mechagodzilla design. There's just something about his face that looks so derpy and not at all menacing in any way. However, this game made me love this take on the character. It really captures the aura of it and you feel powerful. Unironically, it's the worst Mechagodzilla design, but it's the best Mechagodzilla to play as. Mecha King Kidora is one of the worst kaijus in the game. <laughs> okay, let me let me let me reel we'll reel back for a second. Okay. He's one of the worst kaijus in the game when trying to grind through the defend mode of God of Destruction. I mentioned how destructive the vanilla King Kidora is in invade mode, and the same rings true for Mecha King Kidora. The only problem is the goal of defend mode is to prevent buildings from getting destroyed, and that's really hard to do with the majority of these attacks. The out of control gravity beams and laser beam cause surrounding buildings to just get hit no matter what. You can't control it. But that being said, you can easily dispatch whichever kaiju you're fighting because his attacks are still really solid. Beyond aesthetics and a few extra attacks like the machine hand and the energy shield, I do wish there was a little more variation to Mecha King Kidora when compared to his vanilla counterpart. Maybe have the projectile beams be more focused and controlled to prevent unnecessary damage or make him somewhat slower but deal more damage like his movie counterpart. I don't know, I'm not a game dev, but I'm just kind of throwing shit out there, seeing what sticks. The design of Mecha King Kidora, though, is fantastic. Like the other kaijus in the game, it looks one-to-one -one with how it looks in its film appearance. 
Again, it's just a shame because the camera is too close up to the kaiju. I just really wish they took more cues from the Pipeworks trilogy and had the camera farther back to give us some space and to also allow us more freedom to just admire the designs of the monsters. I find myself trying to adjust the camera so I can see the monster I'm fighting, especially when playing as either Ghidorah or even Destroya. Still, despite my qualms with him in defend mode, this is one of my favorite monsters to play as in King of Kaiju. It is by far superior to Vanilla Ghidorah, despite it being just a slightly altered skin with additional attacks. <laughs> If I'm being honest, it took me a while to get on the Kiryu hype train. His appearance makes him seem slow and sluggish, but looks can be deceiving. Playing as Kiryu in this game is an exhilarating experience for several reasons. Firstly, his agility sets him apart from every other kaiju in the game. It allows for swift and nimble movements that make combat dynamic and engaging. What sets Kiryu apart further is the efficiency of his attacks. They don't require prolonged execution, enabling players to just react as quickly as possible. One of Kiryu's signature moves is the railgun attack. It's really notable for its consistent ability to knock back enemies, providing a reliable defensive mechanism in tight situations. Additionally, the option to deploy front rockets after executing various moves adds another layer of strategic depth to his arsenal, allowing players to adapt their approach based on the evolving battlefield dynamics. Kiryu boasts a diverse range of attacks. This versatility enhances the gameplay experience, encouraging experimentation and mastery of Kiryu's combat capabilities. Kiryu's roar, which can be used to block attacks, is one of the longest in the entire game. Beyond all these gameplay advantages, Kiryu just looks cool as shit. Out of all of the Mechagodzilla designs, this is one of my favorites. It combines the best aspects of the Showa and Heisai designs while also being new and refreshing. Overall, 9 out of 10, uh, fucking angry Joe badass seal of approval. A robot? Someone must have created it to stop Godzilla. I know it's a robot, but I can feel a strong positive energy from it. J Jaguar is a fan favorite, so it makes total sense that he would end up as a playable character in Godzilla PS4. If you want a fun gameplay experience, then play as Jet Jaguar. He is one of, if not the fastest character in the entire game. I mentioned how Hidora's belly flop attack is near impossible to block, but that isn't true when playing as Jet Jaguar. He can easily evade that attack and quickly move behind the smog monster and start dealing damage. You can really tell that the devs loved putting Jet Jaguar into the game. My favorite attack of his is the one where he shrinks down to the size of a human and then begins pummeling the enemy. This is one of the best adaptations of the character in a video game. Not that any previous versions were terrible or anything, but this version captures Jet Jaguar's essence in a way that I haven't really seen done before. Granted, you could say that about any kaiju in this game, but it rings true here with Jet Jaguar. This is also one of the few characters in Godzilla PS4 that feels fluid when controlling him. He isn't clunky like Destroya or slow like Space Godzilla. It just feels nice playing as Jet Jaguar. Part of me starts to love the game a lot whenever I play as him because everything feels so smooth and fast paced. I think it's just really funny how Jet Jaguar is consistently the best character in every video game and even like movie and TV show he's in by a complete landslide. There's a reason everyone loves Jet Jaguar and I hope to see him more in in future Godzilla projects. In conclusion, Godzilla PS4 presents itself as an homage to the iconic kaiju franchise, paying tribute to its roots while attempting to offer an engaging gaming experience. Keyword, attempt. The game's tutorial sets the tone with its nostalgic homage to the original 54 film, albeit marred by some inaccuracies. The incorporation of visual effects reminiscent of older Godzilla films also adds to the atmosphere, but it unfortunately hampers gameplay due to significant frame rate drops. Control issues plague the game, making maneuvering and combat frustrating, especially compared to its predecessors like the Pipeworks trilogy. The decision to lock certain moves behind unlockable progression also feels unnecessary and it detracts from the overall enjoyment. While God of Destruction mode offers a semblance of story-driven gameplay, the repetitive nature of destroying generators and combat mechanics diminishes its appeal. King of Kaiju mode, Evolution mode, Diorama mode, and the Kaiju guide offer some variety, but they lack 
any real depth to fully engage players. Online multiplayer mode, while promising, suffers from technical issues and dwindling player base. And as of right now, like the servers are dead. They're, they're, they don't exist anymore. So you can't even play it right now. Evolution mode's progression system feels convoluted and detracts from the core gameplay experience. But despite its shortcomings, I kind of still love this game. Godzilla PS4 has redeeming qualities, including attention to detail in recreating iconic kaiju and environments, as well as the inclusion of Easter eggs and nods to the franchise history. However, these elements are overshadowed by the game's fundamental flaws and controls, gameplay depth, and online functionality. As much as I love this game and would love to say it's a masterpiece and it's the greatest Godzilla game ever made, I have to be realistic here and kind of set my bias aside. Godzilla PS4 falls short of its potential due to its clunky controls, repetitive gameplay, and a lack of depth. Yes, it appeals to the diehard fans like me, but it ultimately fails to deliver a satisfying gaming experience for a wider audience. I'm Cole McCormick. You're watching Firewind Media. I am so tired. I've been recording for like four hours. Um, anyways, thanks for watching. Peace out.